you know, I, I, I've entitled my message today, Messed Up, But, and um, John on the back, he's, he's put that, they found that picture, the little rubber there, it's very significant, isn't it, that rubber? <laughs> yeah, we've all been messed up sometime in our life, but God, and I love the buts in the Bible, you know, it's like, no matter what has gone wrong, but God said, Amen. Amen. So we're going to be there's going to be some butts in our life, and I want to thank God for every butt that He's given me. <laughs> Amen. So the Word of God, it says in the Bible that His Word is like a two-edged sword, and and what I want to speak to you today is kind of two-edged. I've got a half, one half, and then a second half. But first of all, let's just read that, Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And that's very important. Because that's really going to be half of my message, is that how God sees the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts and is able to rub out the faults, if you like, and pass over our failures. He divides in our life between flesh and spirit. He shows us what is godly and what is ungodly. He separates truth from lies and right from wrong and dark from light. And peace from turmoil. And it divides our past from our present and our future. Because he said when he forgives us our sins, he said he's going to take them as far as the east is from the west. And he's not going to ever remember them ever again. Isn't that good news? Yeah. And God never remembers our past. Thank you, Lord. I have a past, but... I have a glorious now and a glorious future. Amen. So we're going to look at three people briefly who had pasts, who had issues in their life, they messed up, and yet God played a big part in their life. And the first one is Exodus chapter 2, where it says, On one occasion, after Moses had grown up, when he'd gone out of his kingdom and witnessed their forced labour, he saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his own kinsmen, looking about and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. In other words, he killed him. The next day he went out and two of his Hebrews were there fighting. And he said, why are you striking your companion? But he replied, who appointed you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses became afraid and he thought, the affair must certainly be known. So, you know, Moses, one of, his, one of his weaknesses or one of his flaws was his anger. He had a big anger issue. And yes, his anger came and flared up because of an injustice over his people. He had, a, if you like, he could see what was happening to his own people, how they were being treated in Egypt. And he had an anger, but the anger spilled over and he went as far as murdering somebody. So then he had to run away. But in the very next chapter, in Exodus chapter 3, God comes to Moses, despite his flaw, despite his anger and him committing murder, there was something in Moses that God saw and he wanted to use him. And I want you to take this message to your own heart. If you're anybody who looks back on your life and thinks, oh, I'm not worthy and God can't use me, then take heart from these people in the Bible. The Lord said, Exodus 3, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I'm aware of their sufferings. God's aware of our sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hittite, and the Jebusite, all those ites. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel 
Pharaohs come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now. He's talking to Moses. And I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And I'm not going to read the other scriptures that I've written down, but there was another incident. Now, God called him to deliver his people. And when he delivered them, they're out in the desert, and he goes and he speaks face to face with God, and God said, I'm going to give you commandments. And God wrote the commandments on stone tablets. What an incredible encounter that must have been. And then when he came down, though, Unfortunately, the children of Israel got impatient because Moses was up there for such a long time with God that they built themselves a golden calf and they began to worship another God of their own making. And again, Moses, his anger flared up. What did he do? He smashed. He smashed the thing. God's handiwork. God had just written these commandments. He was so upset and so angry that he smashed the tablets. I don't think God told him to smash them, but he had that issue in his life. He had that flaw in his life. But you know what? Straight after that, in Exodus chapter 34, the Lord said to Moses, come out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones. And he did it all over again. He gave Moses another chance to take the word of God. And he gives us chance after chance after chance. So if you feel like you've failed in life and you're not worthy of being called by God, then look at the life of Moses. You know, Moses, he was called the meekest man on earth. A meek person is someone who is willing. They are submissive unto God. And so when I read that thing about the Word of God, that he is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, God looked deep into the heart of Moses, and despite his fall, despite his weakness with anger and committing murder, and then destroying the work that God had done for the children of Israel, God said, I'm still calling you. I'm still with you, Moses. And you know the big prayer of Moses, he said, if, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't take us. And God said, my presence is with you, Moses. You know, the devil is very good at bringing people down and making them feel like they can't achieve anything in life because they've had a flaw, because they've done wrong in the past. Maybe they're still struggling. Moses was obviously still struggling with anger. And yet God said, I'm with you. And God was gracious to him because he saw beyond his weakness. He saw beyond his flaws. He saw deep into his heart and he saw a man who had a meek heart who he could speak to face to face and he would listen and he would be submissive to God. And the second person that I want us to quickly look at is David. You know, David had a weakness with lust. We all know what he did. He slept with another man's wife and when she got pregnant, he tried to cover it and hide it all so that he didn't get found out for his guilt. And when that didn't work, he had another plan because he wanted to get away with it. And he sent the man into battle and had him killed so he could marry the wife that this guy had. And no one would know. What an awful thing to do. David obviously had a weakness. And yet, in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says this, Then he removed him, the previous, and raised up David as their king. Of him he testified, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will carry out my every wish. So, look, when I'm saying these things today, I am not condoning any of the actions of these people. And neither did God. But he sees a lot deeper than we do. And he saw in David a heart of worship, a heart.
heart that would be faithful, a heart that would love God, a heart that was actually humble in the end because he wept bitterly over his sin. And although he had that moment in his life where he allowed the lust of his flesh to overtake him, which led him deeper and deeper into more and more gross sin, yet God still called him. God still had him as king and did say of him, he is a man after my own heart. So he saw beyond. God sees beyond your weakness today. God sees beyond your flaws. And the third person is Peter. Apart from having, uh, apart from having a very big mouth, we all know about Peter and his boasts and saying what he's going to do. But he, he actually had a weakness, and that was fear. You know, he he loved Jesus. We know he loved Jesus. Jesus asked him three times. Do you love me? And he said, you know I love you, Lord. And you really love the Lord. And you, I know you love the Lord. But he did have that weakness, didn't he? And he would say, oh, no, no, no. I mean, everybody could desert you, Jesus, but I will never desert you. And then he tried to prevent Jesus from going to Jerusalem. No, you're not going to go. You're not going to go there, Jesus. And Jesus had to say to him, get behind me, Satan. And then when Jesus was crucified and he was with all the other people, people were saying to him, you, we know you were with Jesus. No, we lied out of fear. And in the end, when he'd been asked again and again, he actually cursed and sweared. He actually used foul language to say, I never knew the man, I don't, I've got nothing to do with that Jesus. He did that all out of fear. That was his fall. That was his weakness. But afterwards, when he realised, he ran out, we know that he wept bitter tears. And then when Jesus came back, what did Jesus say to him? Do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord. And he said, well, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Care for my people. So what was Jesus doing? Calling him. Calling him into ministry. And Jesus, Jesus called him to be the first leader of the early church. He preached that amazing sermon on the day of Pentecost. And yet, a little while before, he was cursing and swearing and denying he ever knew Jesus. Why did Jesus call him? Because we've seen it. The word of God goes deep into our hearts. It sees right down to what our motives are. And we know that Peter loved Jesus deeply. And he wanted to serve God. But he had a weakness. If I ask you to put your hand up, I'm not asking you to, but if I say put your hand up if you've got a weakness in your life, you'd probably put your hand up. But don't feel as though that stops you from being a servant of God. It doesn't, because God sees beyond your weakness, beyond your flaw. He sees what your heart is. He sees that you love God truly. And that when you follow the flesh and you do wrong, then you're very sorry about it, like Peter wept bitterly. So that's the first half of what I wanted to share. Because I think it's important that we have that foundation in our life, that we understand the grace of God that has abounded in our life. That his mercy, his grace and his forgiveness is over our life. And no matter how much we've failed, we stand before God forgiven, cleansed. And our past has been put away and forgotten and God sees deeply into our hearts and sees what our love is for him. However, the second half of this, the word of God divides. The word over the church about the presence of God. He said to us weeks ago now, my presence will make your church sticky. That's, that, that's what we believe. We believe that God's going to be filling this hall with people and they're going to stick because of the presence of God. Amen. And we're pursuing that presence as a church. We, we have done that more and more. We're here every Friday night praying and seeking God. 
we say we want to go deeper. Hallelujah. How many of you want to go deeper with God? Woo! We all want to go deeper with God. We want to, that song, let us experience. We want to experience more and more of God's presence. Like that revival that Jim was talking about. Because his presence, it draws people to him. And we want to see people saved. We, we don't want a revival or something. You know, we have a happy bunch of people on a Sunday morning. No, we want to see revival here so that people who don't know him come and find him. That's our passion. That's our desire. But then, as I was praying this week about this, and thinking and dwelling on the presence of God, wanting to be more and more full of God's glory and presence in the church and sticky, <laughs> But there's, there's something we can do in order to facilitate that. Remember that John the Baptist said to the people, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. And that's, that's what God is calling us to do as a hub church. I believe what he wants to do, he has already begun. Hallelujah. But he wants us to be more and more prepared. For the glory of God in this place. Amen. For him to pour out his spirit and to see salvations. To have a culture here of God that is so strong that we affect the culture of our town. Yeah, amen. That's our vision. That's the vision God gave us as a church. To take the kingdom of God and its values and its culture into our town so that amen. lives that are shattered lives that are down and depressed and whatever, they will find hope yes. in the kingdom of God. That's our passion. That's our desire. And when I was praying about it, the scripture came to my heart and it's Hebrews 12 verse 14. And it's about pursuing Um, to pursue something is to go after it, is to make an effort to reach it, it's, it's to want to attain it. We pursue something until it's ours, until we've attained it. Now, in a sense, we know that the gift of righteousness is that, it's a gift. The gift of salvation is that, it's a gift. We are not doing anything, right? to be saved eternally. Jesus has done that all on the cross. But there are responsibilities that we have on our life. And this scripture says, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So that's what God said to me. He said, if you want more and more of my presence, if you want more and more of my glory in the church, then tell the church to pursue peace and holiness. So that's our part. God will always do his part. God longs to pour out his spirit. God longs to save the lost. God longs for us to be blessed and to know him in a deep way. But there are times, that there are things that we have to do. The word will enable us to because the word will come and divide. The word will show us what we need to deal with in our lives. But you know, we've, we've talked about this in our leadership meetings. And we've, I've read about revivals since I was 17 years of age. And the marks, the marks of revival, or the marks of the presence of God, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, is always humility, repentance, Prayer and holiness. There is no shortcut. You know, you can't just, you know, ask in the name of Jesus and it will be done for you. So we ask for revival tomorrow, Lord, you know. No, there are things that we can do. We are to prepare our hearts, our lives, and our minds for the more that God wants to do in this place. This is this is nothing yet. He wants, to, he wants to overflow from this place into our community. He wants to overflow 
with the presence of his Holy Spirit and conviction so that people come and humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and find salvation. And it says, without which, holiness, without which, no one will see the Lord. And I used to believe this, and I still do, that that's about us. You know, we won't see the Lord unless we keep our lives clean. If we, unless we do away with sin. But also, it applies to people who meet us. So, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which they won't see the Lord. So God's desire for, for all of us as a church is that as we experience more and more of his presence in our life and as we prepare the way of God in our life and we turn away from anything the Holy Spirit shows us is wrong, our lives will shine the glory of God into our community. Your life, your language, your disposition, your generosity, your words, everything about you and the, with the presence of God, as you are turning towards holiness, pursuing holiness, it will touch people. They will see it. Yeah. They will see it on you. And they'll want it. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, you know, in the Bible it says, make no provision for the flesh. Let's make provision for God, yeah? Let's make provision for the presence of God. Let's pursue peace and pursue holiness. Let's go after it. Let's not make excuses. You know, well, you know, I've got this, <coughs> this is what I'm saying, we've got, I've got this flaw or I've got this weakness or I have this tendency. No, let, let's not look at that. Let's be with Paul when he says, I haven't obtained perfection yet, but I leave I leave what's behind me, yeah, and I press on. I reach forward. I want to get a hold of everything for which God got a hold of me. Do you want that? Can you imagine what God actually wants for you? And Paul says he's reaching out to obtain, he's pursuing everything to obtain what God has for him. I want everything that God has for me. Do you? As a church, let's, let's, let's pursue God in such a way that we obtain everything that he has for us. Everything. Let's not miss anything. Amen. You know, right at the beginning um, of time in the garden, you remember Adam and Eve sinned and then Cain and Abel were their children. And Cain got upset. He wasn't living right, and he decided that because his brother was blessed by God, that he was jealous of that, and he went out and killed him. Killed his brother out of jealousy. And then God spoke to him in Genesis 4, and he said, If you do well, will you not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, Sin, listen to this, it's crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you, here's a good but, but you must master it. Now can we? That's the question. Can we be holy people? So good amen over there. Can I hear another amen? amen? You know, God doesn't require anything from you or me or the church that is not attainable. That wouldn't be right, would it? So he calls the church to holiness. He calls us to leave, leave the love of the world behind us and the love of sin and the lust of the flesh. He says, master it. We can't do that on our own, I appreciate that. But we're not on our own, are we? Hallelujah. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, and as the Apostle Paul said, if we live by that Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Hallelujah. So we can master it. 
We can prepare the way of the Lord in this place, in this community where we live, in this church. We can prepare our hearts. We can master it. We can walk away from anything that is contrary to God's word. Now, whatever God's speaking to you, it's going to be different for all of us. But believe me, the word of God, that's the two-edged sword, is dividing. He's looking at your heart, and I know you have a good heart. I trust you do. And he's not, going to, he's not going to judge you. But what he is saying is, let's get rid of that. Because I want to pour out my glory in your life. I want to pour out my spirit in your life. I want you to know my presence in such a powerful, tangible way that people you meet, you'll be able to say to them, the kingdom of God has come. Because you're carrying that kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, that, that's what comes. You know, when, when we walk right with God and we do these things and we pursue a holiness, there's such a joy that comes in your heart because you have a clear conscience before God. You feel good. God doesn't want you to be walking around feeling bad about yourself. Last scripture, Jeremiah 15, verse 19. Oh no, good man. Therefore, says the Lord, this was under the old covenant, if you return, and sometimes we walk away from God, and we need to return. I had a time in my life when I went away from God for several years, when I was very young. And I returned. If you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand, and if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. You know, the more we divide between good and bad, and we pursue holiness, the more he gives us a voice. A voice in our nation, a voice in our community, a voice of hope to people who don't have any hope. Amen. A voice of salvation to those who are lost. As we sang, he pursued us, didn't he? He broke down the walls. He pursued, he left the 99, if you like. We need to leave the 99 and pursue people out there who don't know him. But let's be filled with his spirit. Let's be filled with his holiness. You know, that scripture we all know, and we can probably repeat it, if my people. Are we his people? We are, aren't we? You're God's people. If my people, it's a promise. If my people who are called by my name, we have his name. Yes. Will humble themselves. Turn from their wicked ways. But the promise flows from that is heal their land. That's what we want, isn't it, church? We want to see our land healed. We want to see our town affected by the presence and the glory of God. So let's let's take this word seriously. The presence of God is here. We love the Lord. We love His presence, and it's growing and increasing while we're with you. But let's pursue this peace. Let's pursue this holiness. Let's prepare a way in our for more and more of his presence and his glory so that he will give us his voice and so that we will see him heal the land. Oh, we need it, don't we? we need it. Our nation, we need a move of the Holy Spirit. We've seen it moving in another nation. We've seen it through the decades, different times, different places. There's been a move of the Holy Spirit. I've been praying to see this since I was 17. That's a few years. And I've seen God move, don't get me wrong. I've seen miracles. I've seen many salvations. I've seen the glory of God. I, I, I am a blessed man. But I want to see more. Amen. Let's see more. There is a word that 
that says, consecrate yourself. Yeah, that's a decision that we make. We say, I'm gonna, I am gonna set my whole life apart. I'm gonna set my life apart for God. I'm gonna consecrate myself unto the Lord for his kingdom, for his name's sake. And if you want to do that, we can start right now. So if you want to consecrate your life more than you are now, why don't you stand up? And let God know that that's you. Stand up and say, that's me. If you want. If you want to stay as you are, that's okay. God wants to give you more. He wants to fill you more. He wants to touch you in a deep way. And he wants you to be a light shining in the darkness. And Father, we stand here before you as your children, forgiven made righteous through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for it, Father. But Lord, we want to see more. And we want to know you more. We want to be deeply, more deeply connected to you. And so Lord, we stand here this morning and say, Lord, here I am. Take my life. Use my life more, Lord. Fill me more with your presence and your glory. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit right now that gives me the strength and the power to walk in your ways and in your path. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness over your word that you are bringing to pass. And everybody said, Amen.